It's taken 15 years to get from my first cautious investigation through to where we are now with prison doors slamming <laughs> all over the world. But I never lost uh, any faith in the story. I knew they were corrupt. I knew that FIFA was a bunch of scoundrels. And so you go on investigating. You make sources, you get documents. And then one day I got a phone call. Would I uh, come and meet some gentlemen in London? Yes. There in the room waiting for me were two agents <laughs> from the FBI. And I said, hello, and they gave me their business cards and they said, organised crime squad, Federal Plaza, New York. And I thought, that's it. Authorities now understand what I have figured out, that FIFA is an organised crime syndicate. And that was six years ago. And I started helping them with the definitions and the personalities. Then in 2011, I gave them documents on Mr. Chuck Blazer, the American uh, FIFA crook from Trump Tower. Uh, they went and saw him and he rolled over immediately, started incriminating other people. One of them repaid $151 million and the investigation has rolled from there. So it takes time, but you have to get it right. And I'm glad the FBI took time observing checking bank records, wire statements, the DOJ drawing up good indictments that should not fail in court. So if you know something is bad, as a journalist, you've got to work at it. And I did, and they're in jail, and I'm, well, I'm laughing now. <laughs>
I learnt a lot in Palermo, but I cracked the FIFA organised crime story in Rio de Janeiro. It was the Brazilian mafia who took over FIFA in the 1970s and 1980s, when João Havelon, the Brazilian <laughs> entrepreneur, moved in to take control of FIFA. He'd been taught about organised crime by one of the biggest gangsters, the man who ran the, the uh, numbers rackets, uh, uh, the, the slots and the white powder in Rio. And when Joe Havelange arrived at FIFA, he was mobbed up and saw the vast value in these marketing contracts because FIFA had control of the best sports marketing business in the world, the Soccer World Cup. They controlled it. They controlled the marketing rights. The sponsors all wanted parts of it. And so Avalanche put in place this absolute racket. That's all it was. Everybody's paying kickbacks. He made between 50 and 100 million US dollars over the years, um, going through uh, dodgy bank accounts in Central Europe, in, of course, the Caribbean. And the value was immense because you're talking about the biggest global sports event and one little bunch of, bunch of crooks based in Zurich had that to distribute. And they did, and they took the money. The crooks controlling FIFA got away with it for so long because there was no real scrutiny. I'm not a sports reporter. Send me to the game and I might get the scoreline wrong. <laughs> I'm an investigative reporter. I want the documents. I want the sources. And FIFA was covered by sports reporters whose skill was Smith crossed the ball into the penalty area and Jones headed it in. Now, they've never been taught to get the documents, to get the sources, to get inside the organisation, because there's always good people inside a corrupt organisation who will help you. But it took a long time building those sources, making them feel safe that I would never, ever reveal their identity. And the way I did it, the way I broke through, was early on in 2002, I went to one of uh, President Blatter's press conferences in Zurich, and I thought, it's time to stir things up a bit. And lining the auditorium were FIFA officials, the Blazers, all with their um, badges on, FIFA badges, and looking like robots because the boss could fire them at any time. And I went there to send messages to them. So Blatter did his yap, yap, yap at the beginning about how wonderful he was, how wonderful FIFA was, and uh, they were just doing brilliantly. And I waited, and as soon as he finished, I grabbed the roving hand mic and said, Herr Blatter, which he hates because he's president, Herr Blatter, have you ever taken a bribe? Oh, absolute pandemonium. Nobody ever asked that question. They always asked him who was going to get the World Cup next. He was absolutely knocked back by this and sort of stumbled. I, I, I have never taken a bribe. Next day in the London newspapers was the headline, Blatter denies taking bribes. I'd got these bribes onto the agenda, the media agenda, and the officials in Zurich realised that here was a fellow came to their press conference who'd crossed the street for a fight. Herr Blatter, not impressed. And that was what got me inside because the good people saw that I was prepared. Right, <laughs> I'm coming for you, Herr Blatter. I know you're a crook. So I'm radio, I've got a radio scanner on my head sending messages all around the auditorium. I'm here, I'm the boy, give me the documents. Six weeks later, I was standing at midnight in Zurich, down on the quay by the lake, waiting, and suddenly a door opened, I got pulled in, and the good guys were there waiting for me, with armfuls of documents, and it went from there. The lowlifes at the top of FIFA knew that they controlled one of the greatest commodities in world sport, the Soccer World Cup. Everybody around the world wants to watch it. The TV networks want it all around the world, all the, all the individual networks. The big global brands want to associate themselves with something so, so vastly popular. So the lowlifes knew they'd got control of something 
wanted by people with lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Now, the networks didn't pay, Coca-Cola and McDonald's didn't pay. What was done was that FIFA gave the marketing rights to agencies to then sell. So the agencies would skim money off the legitimate payments from sponsors and TV networks and divide it up with the FIFA low lives, giving them very big kickbacks uh, from their percentage cuts of what came in from TV and marketing. And so what a happy little world. They all smiled at us. They all said, look, it's on television all over the world. And their wallets got fatter and fatter and fatter. To get this wonderful commodity, the right to screen the World Cup, money was, kickbacks were filched off at one side. The big networks and the sponsors didn't even know about it, I don't think. But they desperately wanted it. The TV companies wanted it because they could sell fantastic advertising. The, the global brands wanted it because they wanted to advertise alongside the world's most popular sport. So that was a marriage made in heaven, down in hell, the FIFA lowlifes were taking their massive skims and we are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars over the years, thieved from the sport. So when you see pictures from around the world of kids barefoot playing, playing soccer, know that they could have had boots, they could have had showers, they could have had good uniforms, they could have had good, good pitches, but the, but the thieves running FIFA took the money for themselves. Everybody's asking, were bribes paid in order for Russia and Qatar to get to host the World Cup? Well, watch the FBI, watch the newly energised Swiss cops who are going through nine terabytes of FIFA data. But what we do know about the low lives at the top of FIFA is they always had their hands out. And Qatar and Russia will have met these low lives, some of them now indicted, some of them are locked up awaiting trial. Uh, always approach bidding country with their hands out and their empty bags. Uh, we have the evidence of that from 2002 when Japan and Korea were both bidding to host the World Cup, where Germany, a good clean country, but one of the television moguls there paid big bribes to get the votes to get it to Germany. And now we come to, uh, to Russia and to Qatar, two not very democratic if at all, petrodollar rich states. Some of the lowlifes at FIFA would have thought Christmas had come early. Countries with no proper democratic scrutiny and with lots and lots and lots of money, and that's before the oil price went down. And of course, Mr. Putin and the sheikhs of, uh, of the Gulf would have been approaching on the World Cup. Business can be done. And anybody who knows FIFA knows that you have to pay to play. America bid and didn't get it. Why? America didn't pay. England bid. They don't pay. They didn't get it. Russia and Qatar got it. And let's remember with Qatar, the FIFA lowlifes gave the Soccer World Cup to a stretch of broiling sand. You couldn't play there. The players would have died. They're having stakeholder meetings where they move it to the winter, where soccer in Europe will be vastly affected. I don't think it'll ever be in Qatar, but let's wait and see. But it's not just people offering bribes, it's bribes being demanded. And that's the real scandal at FIFA. And let's hope the FBI have got the uh, wire transactions, they may have some telephone calls, the Swiss police may well have the documents now from their raid on FIFA headquarters in Zurich. Let's just hope that we get the evidence and that the bad guys discover what it's really like inside Sing Sing and Attica. If you want to host the World Cup, you've got to pay to play. It's been fascinating trying to report the criminals at FIFA because I found myself in a world where I was the only investigative reporter. Every other reporter was a sports reporter. Fine, they report the sport. I don't. And there was a kind of shutout like, uh, well, we don't know about this. Fortunately, out there, bless their hearts, were the fans. Because the fans have always been able to smell FIFA. Whereas the sports reporters just wanted access to be lied to. What I got was the fans saying, give us more. They gave me an award for a book I wrote 
Um, and there was no football in it, <laughs> none whatsoever. Only documents, stealing, corruption and organised crime. The fans knew it, they just needed me to fill in the gaps. So and then BBC came along, BBC uh, Blue Ribbon Investigation Programme, Panorama. They gave me the space to start seriously filming these lowlifes. So it's taken the press a very long time to catch up. Television is here now and the fans, thank you fans, made it possible for me to feed the kids and put shoes on their feet. You learn a lot about an organisation when you try to report them and they don't want to be reported. Um, when they spit at you and they hit you and they knock you over, you think, wait a minute, they're the ones with the problem, not me. I'm only a reporter and I'm very polite and I don't get in your way when you're walking but I ask the question. And uh, the fans have loved sequences from various airports around the world where I've uh, intercepted them with my crew and said, excuse me, can I ask you how much profit you made from selling black market World Cup tickets this year? And the abuse, I'm not going to repeat some of the things they said, but there's the spitting, which I, <sighs> being hit is one thing, being spat at, I think it's just sort of really, really low life. But it reinforced my understanding that they had to be investigated because there were some very, very dirty secrets. I knew I was doing the right thing after I'd published about three stories in a London newspaper. I got legal threats. They wouldn't talk to me, Herr Blasser banned me from his press conferences, and they sent me lawyers' letters, which are in the way very posh English lawyers talk. You have failed to live up to accepted standards of good journalism. When they say that, you know you've got them. You know you're doing the right thing. And all kinds of threats to sue, you get a few days to retract, or there's going to be massive penalties, and you just they don't answer the questions. So straight away the legal threats went on for about two years. I haven't had any for about ten years. They gave up. <laughs> I think the lawyers were taking them for a ride. Yeah, we'll sort Jennings out. We'll send him a really pompous letter that will frighten him. You know, and you wallpaper the walls with them. After that, I've had the trolling, the uh, spreading bad news stories, setting up websites looking like mine. And even now, I still get the uh, email hits. When I open up my, uh, my, my email in the morning and I see, do you want to unsubscribe from erotic housewives? You know, just <laughs> bin it fast, don't touch it, because that's going to unleash all kinds of viruses. You've got all kinds of pretty girls wanting you to join them on these uh, LinkedIn, other kind of sites. They create CNN and BBC bogus website. How the British government funds ISIS. Well, you know that's nonsense. Don't click. Bin it. And uh, I've mentioned some of this to the Swiss police, and I think as they go through FIFA's documents and financial payments, we may find some th very interesting things. What they don't do is don't use violence, because they're just white-collar criminals. Fortunately, I hope, uh, they don't know how to find someone who could do me physical harm. I know how to protect my computers, and we press on with the investigations. <laughs> The FBI are getting on with doing their job. The Swiss cops are now very actively involved and other police forces may come in. Meanwhile, what do we do about FIFA? And I think we close it down. I don't believe you can reform the Mafia. Mr Gotti, could you stop shifting as much heroin? OK, 50%. Oh, thank you, Mr Gotti. That was very kind of you. You close them down and, when necessary, you put them in jail. And what we need now is a new organisation with a lot of fan involvement. So come on fans, stop complaining and get down to your local county, state level of organisation and let's hear you and let's have transparency, let's have freedom of information. I can find out, you can find out what the American president earns, you can find out a vast amount of information about how your country is governed from Washington and down through the states. You can find this in other countries. FIFA won't put it online. Well, I think we have to say to the sponsors and to the TV networks, you don't do business with them until everything is online. The fans, most of all the fans, can look and see 
what kind of money is flowing around their sport? What kind of airplanes are they travelling in? Do they ever go in the back of the plane with the fans and the football players? No. Let's just have every detail online, just like the government.